Well, thank you for coming today. Beautiful day like today. I know there are a lot of other things you could do around Portland. And on spring forward days, I always wake up thinking, ah, I bet everybody will just say, you know, I lost the hour, so I guess there goes church. <clears throat> Wesley Allen Dodd tortured, molested, and killed three boys in Vancouver, Washington. He was scheduled to be executed on uh, January 4th, 1993, right after midnight. Reporters came from all around the country. Twelve were allowed to be eyewitnesses. When they came out 30 minutes after he, he was executed, uh, they gave the report. One read uh, his final statement. Dodd said, I thought there was no hope and no grace, but I was wrong. I found grace and hope in Jesus Christ. There was an audible gasp and groans in the gallery. People thought, how dare you, after what you've done, claim grace and hope of Jesus? Do you really think God's going to let you into heaven? I mean, shut up, you child killer. Go to hell. It's not going to be so easy for you. I mean, the thought that Dodd could be forgiven and receive grace was utterly repulsive. But you know, it's still that way today. We think about, what do you, what do you think if you died and you got to heaven and you were greeted by Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin or some perpetrator of a school mass shooting? You'd say, what's he doing here? Right? But unless we understand that we're of the same stock as Dodd, fallen humanity will never understand the grace of God. If you think, you know, let Dodd get what's coming to him. Are you willing to get what's coming to you? There's a four-letter word for it. Hell. Whatever you want to say about God, whether you're a teenager, single, married, empty nester, one thing is for sure, God is merciful. He sent His Son to die for our sins. Even though we had sinned against Him, we had our backs turned toward Him, we wanted nothing to do with Him, He died for our sins so that He could be merciful to us. One place that illustrates that God is merciful is Joshua chapter 20. If you want to follow along what I'm looking at today with you in the Bibles that are under our seats, it's on page 232. If you're just joining us, let me catch you up. This is the 10th in a series of messages, putting God's power to work in our lives. We're talking about how we can practically put God's power to work in our lives. God led the people of Israel out of Egypt and promised them to take them into the land of Canaan as their inheritance. They came in with amazing power, with a, God's power. They had a string of victories. By the time we get to Joshua 20, they have driven all the Canaanites out of the land. They've uh, divided up the land into the 12 tribes. And then God says, make six of the cities, let them be cities of refuge. Then the Lord said to Joshua, tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge, as I instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. God cares about details, and this matter of someone killing somebody accidentally not being put to death Oh, you can be grateful for that. If you're out driving late at night, you can hardly see, and somebody jumps out, and maybe a young person jumps out into the road, and you hit them, and they die, you'd be glad that you would not be executed. I mean, there was nothing you could do. 
In Deuteronomy 19, we read, Then set aside for yourselves three cities in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Determine the distances involved and divide into three parts the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So that the person who kills someone may flee for refuge to one of these cities. Now, here's a map of uh, Israel after the conquest of Canaan, and it was divided into 12 tribes. Uh, the starred cities are the six cities of refuge. So uh, two and a half tribes, Ra uh, Reuben, Gad, and uh, Manasseh were on the east side of the Jordan, and they set up three cities of refuge there. Then on the west side of Jordan, nine and a half uh, tribes uh, were, were given land there, and they set up three more cities. All of these cities had to be centrally located so a person could flee there, uh, be able to you know, access the place. The Levites were not given any land. The Levites were the uh, uh, sons of Aaron, uh, Moses' brother. Uh, they were given 48 cities. And around each of the city, they were given farmland so they would have plenty of food. God says, take six of those cities and designate them as cities of refuge. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. Uh, gates in the cities of refuge were never locked. So a person could come, get in, and plead their case. They were given a place to stay and had plenty of food. Uh, cities of refuge is one of the places where we get uh, the principle, a person is innocent until proven guilty, a pillar of our legal system. With social media today, a person can make a claim against another person, unverified, doesn't even have to be true. And the person can have their life, their reputation, and their career ruined. In such an environment, we've lost the presumption of innocence. I mean, how can a person get a fair trial when the whole digital world has gotten worked up into a froth? We need to recover the benefit of the doubt that God provides for us in the cities of refuge. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice of forethought. They are to stay in that city until they have stood trial before the assembly until the death of the high priest who is serving at that time. Any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to these designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. Protection for a foreigner was unheard of in any other culture. God introduced it. This is the rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees there for safety. Anyone who kills a neighbor unintentionally without malice of forethought. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue him in a rage, overtake him if the distance is too great, and kill him even though he's not deserving of death, since he did it to his neighbor without malice of forethought. God provided protection so a person could stand trial. Presumed innocence until proven guilty. Uh, on Mount Sinai, Moses gave, or God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are God's grand moral law that governed the world. Later, the civil law was given. Uh, one of these was murder. These were details about how does the country work, how do, how do cities work, what happens when people get in trouble with each other. Anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are to flee to a place I will designate. Uh, many of the principles uh, we find in the Old Testament are embedded into our legal system. Uh, some modern historians write what I call revisionist history. Uh, they would have us believe that Christian faith and the Bible have nothing to do with our legal system or form of government. Uh, the reason I believe they want to rewrite history is because they don't want there to be a God and real right and wrong. So in preparation for this message, I looked at some of our original documents and those of England. I looked at the Magna Carta, England, 1215, 
Uh, the Bill of Rights in England, 1689. The Mayflower Compact, 1620. The First Charter of Virginia, 1606. Massachusetts, 1629. Maryland, 1632. Connecticut. Rhode Island. New Jersey, 1677. Pennsylvania, 1682. Delaware, 1776. And Vermont. The thing that surprised me was that they were all filled with reference, references that we are chosen as leaders by the grace of God. God wasn't assumed that He exists and that they were allowed to lead by His grace. Even more surprising was the number of times I read in these documents the Word of God. It was assumed that the Word of God is true and that it informed our original documents. Most surprising of all was the number of times, it wasn't many, but the number of times I read that the purpose of their collective efforts was to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, there, there are facts about our history we just can't change. Fifty out of the 55 framers of our Constitution were Christians. A 10-year study in Houston found that out of 15,000 early American documents, I just looked at a few, 34% of the quotes were from the Bible. We're not a theocracy. But when Reformation Christianity provided the consensus, which it did until 75 years ago, people looked back to the civil law God gave Israel as a pattern and base. We're no longer a Christian culture, so we're seeing changes in our concept of law. Two changes we're seeing in our post uh, Christian culture are, is the foundation of the law. Now, city of Refuge were all ruled by the Levites. These were the priests and ministers. So the cities of refuge were based in God. The foundation for new laws today is relativistic. It's no longer based on the idea that there is a God and that there is right and wrong that's built on His holy character. The second change we're seeing in our law today is a, a, a change in the seriousness of sin or seriousness of murder, which is what I'm talking about. But if out of hate someone lies in wait, assaults and kills a neighbor, and then flees to one of these cities, the killer shall be sent for by the town elders, <clears throat> be brought back from the city, and be handed over to the avenger of blood to die. Show no pity. You must purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood so that it may go well with you. When a person murdered with intent, they were to be put to death. Why? Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For, here's the reason, in the image of God has God made mankind. Taking life is serious because all human beings are made in the image of God. Human worth is based on the fact that God exists and has character. So we live in a true moral universe. The murderer has real moral guilt, something our modern culture knows nothing about. Everything hangs on the truth that God exists and has character. God's character is the law of of the universe. So murder is serious. Sin is serious. But God is merciful. He wants legal protections for people. Anyone who kills a person is to be put to death as a murderer only on the testimony of witnesses. But no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. One witness is not enough. God says there has to be two. Well, this is part of our legal system today. You have a stronger legal case, the more credible witnesses you have. You may ask, if God is so merciful, why is the book of Joshua so bloody? does no good to pretend it isn't. Not only is something violent taking place, the killing of hordes of people, but that violence is happening to women, children, <clears throat> and even animals. For many people, this violence is a barrier to them embracing the message of the Bible. You may be one of them. You wonder, how do you reconcile the love of Christ we find in the New Testament with God driving out Canaanites in Joshua? 
For example, look at the destruction of Jericho. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and the sound, and at the sound of the trumpet, <clears throat> when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Why destroy women, children, elderly, and even animals? Israelites did the same thing to the people at Ai. When Israel had finished killing all the men of Ai in the fields and in the desert where they chased them, when every one of them had put to the, been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killed those who were in it. Twelve thousand men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he destroyed all who lived in Ai. As the Israelites swept through Canaan, we read things like this. That day Joshua took Machedah. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors, and he did to the king of Machedah as he had done to the king of Jericho. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, Negev, western footholds, mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. You may wonder, why would a merciful God kill people he had created? Now, some suggest these texts are not to be taken literally. If the supposed commands are not history, there's no problem. Such an explanation does not square, however, with Jesus' teaching. Jesus says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. That's a reference to himself. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Jesus believes that God destroyed people in Noah's day and at Sodom. The Apostle Paul confirms that God drove out the Canaanites. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as their inheritance. So we can't say these things didn't happen. So we're still left with the question, why would a merciful God do this? Here are a couple thoughts that have helped me. God is merciful even as he is just. God is never unfair with people. The Canaanites were descendants of Noah just as much as the Israelites. Uh, they received the same truth about God that the Israelites did. They were shown the power of God and were invited to believe. But most of them hardened their hearts and worshipped the God of Baal. Baalism was a fertility cult. Uh, they uh, glorified sexual license. They had prostitutes, male and female, at their worship sites for the sexual gratification of worshipers. Their religious ceremonies also included child sacrifice, witchcraft, and snake worship. It was bad stuff. So God punished them. Isn't it his right to do so? Don't we, at times... Want God to do the same? We struggle when God does not punish injustice. We want Hitler, Osama bin Laden, and perpetrators of mass shootings to face justice, don't we? We must approach this whole question of why God punished the Canaanites with reverence. God knows things we don't know. I'm thinking of a man whose teenage daughter questioned her father's protection. She had a toxic boyfriend. He darkened her thought life and caused her to question all the values this man had taught her. The boy had ca cast a spell over her. So the father demanded that the two break up. When they refused, he moved the family. He resigned from his job and put his house on the market. Can you imagine the, the tantrum his daughter must have had? Feeling like your dad was just, you know, going way over the top. But in his mind, it was necessary protection. Those who accuse God of an overreaction in Canaan must take time to remember, we weren't there. 
We did not know the Canaanites. We're not omniscient, but God knows everything. He has His reasons. It's also important to point out that God didn't just punish the Canaanites. He punished Achan, an Israelite, when he disobeyed God and stole from Jericho. When Israel disobeyed in 722 B.C., God used the Assyrians to kill some of them and carry many others of them into captivity. When the people of Judah disobeyed God in 586 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took thousands of people into captivity. That God's judgment will fall is inevitable. The Canaanites knew about the God of Israel, yet they refused to follow Him and turn from their wicked ways. That some believed in the God of Israel, like many Egyptians, uh, Rahab the prostitute and the Gibeonites, shows us that there was opportunity available to believe. Had they turned from their wicked ways and false gods, God would have forgiven them. God is patient and merciful with all of us. Peter says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. As some understand slowness, He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. As you study the Bible, you don't come away with the conclusion that God is unfair. What God commanded the Israelites to do to the Canaanites is unique. The vast majority of places in the Bible you find a God who heals, rescues, redeems. Hasn't He earned our trust that He has good reasons? The surprise is not that His judgment comes, but that it is so slow in coming. I mean, come on! He gave the Canaanites 600 years! A line that Jory taught me is that mercy always precedes judgment. Remember that. Haven't you experienced that in your life? God has been merciful with you, giving you time to turn. Even today, though, billions of people ignore Him. God waits. There's a second thought that helps me. God chooses Israel as the nation where He will present His only Son. Israel is the precious casket in which his priceless jewel is to be placed, the Savior of the world. God has to preserve the nation Israel for the coming of Christ. They need to be pure and obedient to him, for he is revealing himself through them to the entire world. If they do not destroy or drive out the Canaanites, more than likely they'll intermarry with them, assume their wicked practices, and forsake the Lord God. God says, However, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. The reason for such a command? Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord God. Joshua says the same thing when he brings the people into Canaan. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. Uh, this was, he spoke this after they had pretty much driven out the Canaanites, but there were st- few pockets still available, or still there. If you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs, and thorns in your eyes. If they spare women and children, the women will lure the Hebrew men into the worship of their gods. The children will grow up and come back to haunt them. We find this in the Middle East today. Children are taught to hate. They grow up to further the conflict. If the Hebrew people are to be obedient, they must completely drive out those who will lure them away from their allegiance to God. Still, you object. Isn't the destruction of entire cities overkill? If your goal is to preserve a, a nation uh, for, uh, that's pure for the coming of Christ? It's like a pest control company coming out to your house and setting sticks of dynamite all around your house, and you just called them to come check a, a wasp nest up in the eaves. You say, wait a minute, I just want you to take care of the wasp, not destroy my house. But God's judgment against the Canaanites does not go too far when you consider His purpose. 
God's purpose is to establish knowledge of himself in the earth. This requires a relentless warfare with idolatry. When you analyze idolatry down through the years, people are really worshiping not just the idols, but the demons lurking behind them. A lot of people say, well, what's the problem with idolatry? These are just dead pieces of stone and wood. No, no. We find that behind them are the demons. That's who they're really worshiping. God has to clear away the rebel Canaanites to preserve his truth so that someday all people on earth can hear of his love. His severity becomes intelligible when we understand what is at stake. His purpose is nothing less than the salvation of the world. By the way, God will do this again. On Judgment Day, He will once and for all judge all that is evil. The devil and all of his followers will taste the just judgment of God. On that day, at that moment, no one will question God's right to do so. God is merciful, even when he is meeting out justice. We see an example of this when we look at the similarities between the cities of refuge and Christ dying on the cross. Christ is easy to reach. Uh, the cities of refuge were centrally located, so a person would have time to flee there. We can put our faith in Christ at any time. Jesus says, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Uh, the church is to tell the good news. We are to say to people everywhere, we are a place of refuge. The truth is that Jesus is easier to reach than the cities of refuge. In Joshua's day, a person that unintentionally killed someone might have to run miles. They could fail on the way. Today, you can call out to Jesus for forgiveness anywhere, at any time. Christ is available to all. The cities of refuge were for Hebrews and foreigners. Christ's invitation is also for all people. Christ never locks his gates. Uh, cities of refuge uh, never locked their gates. They never wanted a situation where a peace and person was running for refuge and uh, they knocked on the door, but before the door could be opened, the avenger caught up with them and killed them. Jesus never locks his gate. There's no need for you to wake him. He's God. He never sleeps. His door is always wide open. Christ is a sufficient refuge. Cities of refuge had plenty of food so people could be well cared for. Christ's death is completely sufficient to provide you with forgiveness for your real moral guilt. And when we commit our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and takes up residence within us. He provides us with resurrection power to meet all of our needs. This is what we've been talking about in this series. The, um, God, putting God's power to work in your life. The God gives you the Holy Spirit who gives you all the power you need. If we do not flee to the refuge God has given us, there is no help for us. God provided cities of refuge, but people had to come. Likewise, God has provided forgiveness of sins and new life for everyone on this earth. But we have to come. We have to humble ourselves, admit that we need Christ. There is, however, one important difference between the cities of refuge and Christ our refuge. Cities of refuge only protected the innocent. They protected those who had unintentionally killed someone. Christ died for the guilty, for the deliberate sinner. Who's a deliberate sinner? Every one of us. How's it possible for a holy God to forgive deliberate sinners? Jesus died on the cross for the smallest of sins and the largest of sins. Since he died for all sins, he can forgive people like Wesley Allen Dodd. There's no sin too big for the Savior. 
If God is not big enough to save Wesley Allen Dodd, then he's not big enough to save me. If you've never received God's mercy, you can say today, God, I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus is your son. Would you come into my life and make me a new person? And he will come because God is merciful. God's mercy is inexplicable. It doesn't have a drop of logic or a thread of rationality. And yet it is that very irrationality that gives the gospel its greatest defense. For only God can be merciful like that. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for thinking of cities of refuge. We're just delighted to see that you thought about so many details of how life can work and that you're such a merciful God. You wanted people to be able to stand trial and be presumed innocent until proven guilty. And we thank you for the mercy you've shown us. Every one of us here would say, oh my, you have been so merciful to us. I want to give you a moment just to talk to God. Would you thank Him for His mercy? Maybe recognize that I understand, God, that You're merciful to every person on this globe. Whether they follow You or not, You are very patient and merciful. And thank, them, thank Him for His mercy to you. If you've never given your life to Christ, ask for His mercy, you could do it right now and invite Jesus to come in and forgive you your sin. You pray. Lord God, thank you that you are a merciful God, that we have a, a message of mercy to share with people around the world, not judgment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.